I want to welcome you here to the 43rd annual Geneva Spring Lecture. Uh, we are very pleased to be joined with our partners here at Trinity Episcopal Church. Uh, and excited with our work here with them as well. We are also partnering with the Lutheran Senate Peace Not Walls organization and with Bright Stars of Bethlehem. And we are about cooperation, and this is a wonderful expression of that. The issue we are dealing with, though, is one that lacks a great deal of cooperation. It is conflict. We know that in Israel today, there are many competing forces and perspectives. Some see the present conflict, but don't understand its background and its history and all the things that have led up to today. Some hear the uprisings and take sides, but really don't know all the underlying issues. Israel comes to our attention when there's a major problem, but we often don't hear about the day-to-day -day situation. We all know that there are a multitude of issues, racial, national, economic, political factors all at work. And of course, there are the faith traditions involved. At least four major faith traditions meet in Israel. Now you might already be thinking four, at least, but of course the Jewish, the Christian, and the Muslim, but also a great deal of secularism, which itself is a religious force in our world, and they all meet in Israel. We can list far many more issues and aspects. The U.S. has played a major role in the past 70 years Every U.S. president in my lifetime has had the goal of finding the solution. There have been treaties and there have been peace agreements, but most have failed. Some of the approach today, especially in the U.S., has been driven by rather poor theology and theological traditions and difficult political positions that at times increase the problems. We hear from politicians, but seldom from people involved. Today we have that great privilege to hear from a person who has lived the story, still experiences and explores it from many perspectives. Dr. Mitri Rahib, Rahab, I said it wrong, I knew I was going to. Dr. Mitri Rahab is a Palestinian, a Christian leader, a scholar, an educational leader, a social activist, and a pastor. In his book, Faith in the Face of Empire, which if you are interested after the lecture, there are copies available on the back that you may purchase. The book explores his story, the story of his people, the story of his land and nation in the light of the biblical story. The land has almost always been in the midst of the conflict of empires, and still is today. Dr. Rahab's book shows us how the biblical story and people today continue to call out for liberation, for freedom. But that call is based in difficult questions. Questions of where is God in this? Questions of what is God doing? Questions of for whom is God is at, at work? What has Jesus the Messiah brought to life that makes any difference? How is the Spirit leading us to live and to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? How do we live with faith, hope, and love through imaginative, creative resistance? I found that phrase, a wonderful phrase in this book. Imaginative, creative resistance. And so we welcome Dr. Mitri Raheb to help us hear the story from a multitude of perspectives, but most of all, his personal life and perspective, to see more of the issues and to learn to follow a tough calling of growing hope in times of crisis. 
Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for this uh, introduction, and uh, uh, thank you all for coming this <clears throat> afternoon um, uh, here, and uh, I'm glad to see so many friends. Some of them came like four-hour drive, uh, five-hour drive from many different corners, so uh, I feel really privileged to see uh, all of you old as well as uh, hopefully new friends. Um, <clears throat> I guess when <clears throat> a friend of mine, a pastor, uh, wrote me a few months ago, said, uh, we would like to have you come to Iowa. I said, great. Iowa was my first trip ever to the US was to Iowa back in 91. And you know, it's like the first love, you know? <laughs> but then I said, when? And she said, in February. I said, I'm not sure really that I would like to come in February to, to Iowa. Can't we do it in summer or so? But I have to say, I mean, what a great day. The sun is shining. Um, and a better day uh, could not, uh, we could not have asked for it. Especially that, you know, I was very worried because I have to catch the plane tonight in O'Hare, and if there was like a snowstorm or something, I would have been stuck and I need to be in Vienna tomorrow for a major uh, uh, global religious uh, summit. So in that sense, I think everything uh, worked really well and I'm really glad to be among you today um, to talk about uh, a tough calling, growing hope at times of crisis. And those, uh, maybe just let me, uh, as an introduction, I'm not sure if everyone uh, knows uh, a bit about my background. Um, Palestinian, Arab, Christian, and on top of that, even a Lutheran pastor. Uh, I know it sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. Uh, because remember, this is where Christianity started. I was born in Bethlehem. I know it sounds biblical, but this is how it is. Uh, and I'm talking about Bethlehem, Palestine, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, just <laughs> to be clear. Um, and I always like to make the point that the Bible did not originate in the Bible Belt. Thanks God, I mean, <laughs> right? Uh, but it originated from Palestine. This is where the whole story started. And so it's exactly with this background that I come to tackle this topic, a tough calling. Now, as a pastor, I know that actually every pastoral calling is tough. I know we have here many pastors and I'm sure they can agree with me. I mean, it's really not an easy thing to be a pastor. Uh, I saw many colleagues uh, having burnout. Uh, I saw several colleagues quitting uh, their job. Uh, and so pastoring at large is, is, is tough, but pastoring in that part of the world is even tougher. And uh, I share with you something about, uh, you know, my calling. Uh, uh, I served for the last 30 years as senior pastor at Christmas Lutheran Church in Bethlehem. And so some of the, what I will share with you is really built on that. And really it's tough to be pastoring in that context because, uh, you know, I was five years old when Israel occupied Bethlehem. The first memories I have from my childhood actually are the memories of the Israeli uh, tanks coming, rolling into our narrow street, 
next to the church of the Nativity. These were the first memories I have as a child. And I'm now 55 years old, and within this time, this period, uh, we went through 10 wars, which really means, in average, every five years, we have a war or a semi-war going on. The last was the war on Gaza back in 2014, so three and a half years ago. So imagine what does it mean really to live in a, in a context of continuous wars. I mean, you know, people try really, uh, you know, to build a living, to build a business, and then they get interrupted. And then they need, you know, to gather their strength again and to try to start over and over again. But how many times in life can you start over? That's a tough calling. But also being a Palestinian Arab is not easy because, you know, with all, all, all the stereotypes about, about Arabs and about Muslims and about Palestinians, you always feel that, you know, you have to prove that you are kosher. <laughs> while other people don't need to prove that all the time. So you are always, you know, under that, you know, uh, uh, under that, uh, almost like in a test. And being a Palestinian Christian itself, you know, it's tough in itself because, you know, for you here, you read the Bible and it's all good news, you know? God promising his people a piece of land and that piece of land is not Iowa. And they will not chase you out in the name of the Bible. But in our part of the world, it's as, you know, God, I mean, the good news is that our land is taken away from us given to colonizers in the name of God, and we need to be happy that God is doing that. That's tough calling. I think if, if we had, you know, if the Soviets were our occupiers, it would have been much, much easier. We could have even President Trump on our side. I'm not sure about him, but I mean, <laughs> with... <laughs> But it's really tough calling when, when you live in a context, especially like now when, you know, you look through the tunnel and you don't, not only that you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, you don't see even the tunnel itself. Tough calling. So this is really the context I come from as a background just to know what I'm talking about. Uh, and you know, this is why I think hope is not always something that, you know, wow, everything is so bright. Something hope, sometimes hope, expresses itself in lamentations. I was preaching about it this morning, you know. Uh, where are you, God? We heard it from the pastor in the introduction. Uh, why are you so silent? Uh, why are you doing anything about it? I mean, you know, how many churches have been praying for peace in the Holy Land, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and we are further from peace like never before? And so we ask the question, God, where are you? Why aren't you hearing all of these prayers? But as I said, Hope sometimes expresses itself as lamentation. And why is lamentation hope? Because it means we are not giving up on God. We are not giving up on God. You know, we try all the time to challenge him to act, uh, to come, to save, to bring peace. And so lamentations can be actually a sign of hope. 
uh, how long, O oh Lord? And you know, this question is a question that, you know, we have to deal with all the time. You know, it was 100 years ago, 1917, when Lord Balfour had his declaration. I always like to make, uh, you know, to make the point that it wasn't Lord God that promised the state of Israel the land. It was the Lord Balfour. Big difference between the Lord God and the Lord Balfour. Lord Balfour is the empire of that time, the British Empire. The Lord God came always to rescue those who are oppressed. Two different stories. But so it's 100 years, and we keep saying, how long, O oh Lord, you know? 70 years ago, 77% of Palestine was lost. And over 700,000 people of our people were kicked out, including many Palestinian Christians. And so we say, how long, O oh Lord, these refugees will be still scattered all over the world? How long? But it's also 50 years ago that Israel occupied Bethlehem, and this occupation seems not to end, you know. So we say, how long, O oh Lord? So, lamentation can be a sign of hope because we are not giving up on God. Otherwise, we will stop saying, how long, O oh Lord, once we give up on God. But we have not given up on God. And so, let me come to the topic, how to grow hope at times of crisis. I just explained to you the context and the crisis. So how to grow hope? You know, I wish I could give you a recipe and you take it with you home and, you know, you can do it. Unfortunately, there are no recipes for hope. I cannot tell you do this or do that and this is how it is. Because I feel hope is grace. When you can hope at times of crisis, when you can hope against all odds, when you can hope against hope, then you know it's really not you. It's grace at work. And this is how I see it. You know, I mean, uh, the whole ministry, our DNA is really about hope, but it's not something that we invented or we were able to do. I feel that was actually a privilege that God gave us. Hope is grace. So let me share with you something about how to grow hope uh, in, in times of crisis. And let me start by saying what hope is not. It's always easy when we can exclude few things. Because I think many people, you know, they mean with hope something that has nothing to do with hope. So what hope is not? Hope is not optimism. Uh, there is a big difference between optimism and hope. Optimism has to do with optic. So you look and you see it looks like it's going to be better. That's optimism. But this has nothing to do with hope, because if you are optimistic, you don't need hope. If you are optimistic, why hope? And no need especially for Christian hope. So hope has nothing to do with just relax, it's going to be better. That's not hope. Hope is not, let's hope for tomorrow. Maybe something will happen. That's not hope. That's optimism. I guess hope maybe was, <clears throat> I call this cheap hope, because it's really not hope, it's optimism. Uh, you know, when you analyze the situation in Israel-Palestine, you cannot be optimistic. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, the Israeli settlements, colonies, 
growing everywhere in the West Bank, taking all of our land. How can you be optimistic? You know, seeing a one-sided U.S. policy towards Israel-Palestine. I mean, how can you be optimistic? Um, you know, looking at the future, how the land is, is being, the environment, uh, you know, uh, damaged, you know, you really cannot be optimistic. Uh, so, I mean, unless you are crazy, uh, you really cannot be optimistic. But this is why I always say hope is not optimism. Because hope maybe was best uh, characterized once by Martin Luther, if I may quote Martin Luther in this Episcopal church. Uh, you know, he said once, uh, even if I knew that the world is coming to an end tomorrow, so even if things look, you know, so uh, dark that it seems that there is no future. He said, even if I knew that the world is coming to an end tomorrow, he said, I will go out today into the garden, not tomorrow, tomorrow it's too late. I will go out today into the garden and plant olive trees. As a good German, he spoke about the apple tree, because this is what works well in Germany. But in Palestine, we talked about the apple trees. So that's hope, actually. It's, it's looking, analyzing the situation, you know, uh, really understanding what's going on, uh, understanding the mind of the colonizer, seeing what really Israel is after, seeing, you know, that there is no light at the end of the tunnel, and yet going out today into the garden, into the society, and making a difference. That's hope. That's hope against hope. Second, hope has nothing to do with waiting. So hope is not waiting. You know, I had a church member uh, in, at Christmas Lutheran Church. Uh, he died a few years ago. You know, and uh, he was the most optimistic person I ever saw. I mean, you know, he lived through so many wars, but he was always listening to the news. And when, you know, say King Hussein was meeting with someone, he would say, you know, let's wait and see what will come out of that, of that meeting. Maybe they will solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you know. And when Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of State, was coming, you know, to, to Israel-Palestine, he will say, oh, let's see, you know, Condoleezza Rice is coming. Maybe, you know, she will fix the problem, you know. And then, uh, I'm not sure what uh, the German chancellor uh, will come and meet with Arafat and, uh, you know, he will say, wow, you know, let's wait. It seems, it looks positive, you know. Maybe they come out with something. So he was always you know, waiting for something to happen. It's almost like waiting for the Messiah. But it's not only him. I have two American friends. Uh, one of them is a devout Republican. I mean, really, really, really Republican. And um, when uh, George W. Bush was up for election the second time, he told me, you know what, if George W. Bush will be re-elected, he will make peace in the Holy Land. He was convinced that George W. Bush is the Messiah who's going to come and fix our situation. And I had another friend who was a devout democ uh, Democrat, really Democrat. And he was of the opinion that if President Obama will be re-elected, he will be able to fix it. He was so sure that President Obama is serious. And I remember, you know, sitting with them over a glass of wine in the evening and discussing these things. And I remember telling each one of them, you know what? I'm, what, I'm not waiting anymore for the Messiah. 
And you know why? Why? Because our Messiah came, came 2,000 years ago. And we know it for a fact because he came to our land. So why wait for another? Obama, Bush, Arafat, you name it, are all politicians. <laughs> they are, are after our votes or after whatever, are af our money or whatever, but they are not the one who are going to fix the problem. So hope has nothing to do with waiting for that Messiah because we believe that our Messiah came 2,000 years ago. He said what needed to be said. He did what needed to be done. And the ball is in our court. Either we do it or we leave it. Which really means, and our tagline as Bright Stars of Bethlehem is called, hope is what we do. Hope is what we do. It's not what we see. It's not what we're waiting for, but hope is what we do. We are the hope of this world, or there is no hope for this world. And the third point, hope is not something to come in the life after. You know, I meet sometimes with many people, and they tell me, you know, this world is so hopeless, so thanks God, we will have it better in the life after. That might be true, but that's not enough. You know, when I meet with young people in Palestine, and I talk to them, many of them have no problem to believe that there is life after death. Most of them believe that something will come after life. You know what their problem is? They cannot believe that there is life before death that is worth living. This is very dangerous. When people put their hope only in the life after, and they cannot see any more hope in the life before death. So hope for me cannot be just once it's over, it, it will start somewhere else. But hope has to be something for this life. So, you know, because Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And he was not talking about life after when he said that. He was talking about here and now. Remember, he was saying that in Palestine, when Palestine was under Roman occupation. So lie, hope cannot be something that just for the life to come. It has to start here. So that was, so hope is not what we see, not optimism. Hope is not for the life after, and hope is not waiting. So what is hope? We said what hope is not, but what is hope? Again, I have three points. <laughs> you know, Lutherans usually, they like these three, three, three points. So hope is resistance. Uh, and when I look at the Bible, I see that the Bible is a book of hope infused with resistance. This is how I read it. It's hope infused of resistance. I mean, if you, if you look at, uh, you know, at, for example, the book of Revelation, it's a book of resistance against the Roman Empire, but it's infused with hope. But even if you look at Genesis 1, you know, written in, in exile uh, under Babylonian rule, it's again infused with this hope that everything, and God looked and everything was good, and yet it's resisting that imperial theology that it's the stars who control people's life. So the whole Bible, really, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, is a book, it's an infusion of hope and, and resistance. 
And our forefathers and foremothers in the Bible, they kept resisting. The whole Bible is, I mean, all chapters for me, they have to do with resistance. They kept resisting. Why they kept resisting? Because they never gave up hope. Once you stop resisting, then you have surrendered to hopelessness. Once you stop resisting, it's over. And this is why our forefathers and foremothers, they kept resisting because they kept hoping, because hope and resistance, they go hand in hand. The moment we stop resisting, it means we have given up hope. And so the preaching, if you look at the preaching about, uh, the, the preaching of Jesus about the kingdom, this was a resistance because the kingdom was a concept to resist the empire. But it was also hope that there is something bigger than the empire, even bigger than the Roman Empire. Imagine, I mean, those people in Palestine, you know, who have nothing, they live in this corridor of history, and Jesus was telling them, you know what? There is something bigger than the Roman Empire. It's the kingdom of God. And guess what? You are the ambassadors of this kingdom. That's resistance infused with hope. So, I mean, as long as there will be occupation, there will always be resistance. This is what the whole story actually, the biblical story is all about. I mean, this is the story of the Jewish people under, under all the recurring empires that they kept resisting. And suddenly they don't want us to resist when they become part of the empire. Right? But the Jewish story is all about that continuous resistance. You can name it, you know. First revolt, second revolt, which is funny because we have first intifada, second intifada, same thing. Because it's part of the same story. Wherever there is occupation, there will be resistance. So the question is not to resist or not. The question is how to resist. And I think the pastor pointed to that before when he talked about imaginative, creative resistance. That's what we are interested in. Because, you know, the empire, the occupier, they would always like to push us to the wall and to bring us to despair. You have no chance. We are much more powerful. We have the latest equipment. We are the seven largest, you know, uh, military arsenal in the world. We have the best connection to the White House and to, the, to Congress. You know, if we want, we can even humiliate, you know, the president of the U.S. in Congress with 26 standing ovations. We are very powerful. So they will always want to bring us to despair. But resistance, creative resistance, is about hope. Because hope and resistance go hand in hand. I remember 2002 when Israel invaded Bethlehem. And you remember that story with the standoff at the Church of the Nativity. And we are just two blocks away and so we were under curfew 24-7. Um, Israeli soldiers came to our compound. They occupied it for three days. Uh, uh, Israeli tanks were stationed just outside of our home. Uh, and they were very scary moments. Uh, what we built, we built a conference and a cultural center over five years. And part of it was destroyed in 11 hours. And I got sick because I think with all of that and nobody was able to come, we were not able to leave the house, no one was supposed to, 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 to visit us. And the first person to be allowed to come into our neighborhood and to talk to us was the CNN correspondent in, in Israel at that time. His name is Ben Wiedemann. And Ben came to our home the staircase to our home was blown away with the Israeli uh, tanks. Um, 
and he came. I was sick. I had pneumonia uh, and uh, was in my pajama sitting there, and he interviewed me uh, and said, you know, Pastor, uh, don't you get angry. I mean, you see what you have built so hard in five years was destroyed in a few hours. Don't you give up hope. They said, you know, I mean, even as pastors, we are at the end of the day human beings. We get angry, we get depressed, we get despair. But I told him, you know what? Uh, every time we got angry, we start a new project. He said, now I know you must be a very angry person with all the <laughs> projects you are doing, you know. But that's creative resistance, you know. Not allowing the empire to push you to the wall, to bring you to despair, to push you to give up hope, because hope and resistance go hand in hand. The second point, what hope is, hope is investing at a time when no one wants to invest. That's hope. And maybe the best example in the Bible is the prophet Jeremiah. Maybe you know the story of the prophet Jeremiah. He lived around the Babylonian uh, uh, destruction uh, of Jerusalem. Uh, he was put to prison. The temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was occupied. People were, the best people were pushed into exile. And here is Jeremiah sitting in the prison. Everything was lost. And you would think, so what's next? And Jeremiah sends after one of his relatives and told him, I would like you to go and to buy me a piece of land in Jerusalem. Crazy. I mean, you know, who would like to invest in Jerusalem when Jerusalem is destroyed, when the temple is burned down, when the empire is just sitting there? Who is this crazy person to invest at times like this? But this is exactly what hope is. Hope is investing at times when no one is ready to invest. That's hope. You know, in 2003, when Israel started building the wall around Bethlehem, and Bethlehem now has a wall from three sides, life in Bethlehem became very desperate. A city cannot grow. We cannot start new neighborhood. Uh, uh, it will be overcrowded high unemployment. So who would like to invest in a context like this? We said we will invest. And so in 2006, we opened the first university college in the whole of Palestine that focused on arts and culture. We don't teach theology, we teach some theological courses, but it's not a seminary and it's not politics, but it's really, it's, it's art and film and music and uh, theater and dance and design, everything that speaks about life. And people, when they heard me saying, we're going to build this university, they said at times of like this, are you crazy? I said, you know, a crazy world like ours need crazy people like us. Because imagine if we would leave the world to the many crazy people that are out there. We just cannot give up on our land. We cannot give up on our community. And hope is to invest at times when no one else would like to invest. And we started 2006 with 18 students, we have now around 500 students, and these are some of the most creative people in Palestine. That's the, the creative, future creative leaders for Palestine are there. 
So hope is investing when no one else is ready to invest. But the third point I would like to see is that hope is always action, never reaction. Hope is always action, never reaction. Because again, the empire wants us to react. You know, they use state terror because they want us to revert to violence. <laughs> and then we became the terrorists, and they became the nice people. The Romans tried that. <laughs> All empires tried that, you know. In the UN, they say it uses excessive force, but actually it's state terror. So they want us to take arms. They want us to react. Hope has nothing to do with the action. Hope is action. You know, I can say it that from my own experience, you know, there isn't one week that I don't get an attack. You know, it could be in the newspaper, it could be on the internet, you name it. You know, many, even, you know, evangelical pastors, they were sending me life threats because I'm questioning, you know, that promise that they talk about. <laughs> and in fact, coming to this lecture, the friend that who invited me here, she called me and said, you know, there is this, somebody uh, passed on to me an email written against you. And so how should we respond? I said, you know, hope has nothing to do with reaction. Let them write whatever they like. We stick to our goal. We will not allow anyone to derail us. Because, you know, they want us to go into that small fight here and to that small fight here. What we do is we keep telling our story and that, let them react. <laughs> we will not react to what they are saying. And, you know, sometimes you feel, uh, you know, I mean, yesterday somebody uh, sent me an email, very nasty uh, article written against me. Uh, very, very nasty one by supposedly a Lutheran professor in the U.S. You know, I read it. It's, I mean, it's very painful to read, you know, all the bad thing that he writes against me. And this is professor supposed to be, you know. But, you know, after a while I said, you know, this is great because what this professor is saying, you know, is that we are successful. <laughs> Otherwise, they will not attack us, you know. They, they are afraid that we started to crack their software, to crack this Christian Zionist software. You know, that, 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 uh, that prosperity gospel you know, that gospel infused with arm rays. We are cracking that and say, that is not God. <laughs> this is not the God that we came to know in the Hebrew Bible or in Jesus Christ. So we will not react because they want us to go there. But no, we keep acting. So three points what hope is not. Three point what hope is. Now, three other points. <laughs> How to grow hope. And for me, uh, to grow hope, th three things are important. And the three things has to do with looking for the signs of hope. Looking for the signs of hope that are there. You know, sometimes, you know, it's still winter. Everything is cold, everything is barren, and you look between two stones and you see a very small plant, green plant, coming, promising spring. That's the sign of hope. And we have to keep looking for these signs of hope 
in our world that are telling us that spring is coming. And I would like to share from my experience uh, three areas where I see signs of hope. As I said, as pastors, we are human beings. Sometimes, I mean, it's too much. And when I feel it's too much, I go there where I know there is hope and where I can see these signs of hope. And do you know where I found them? In our students. I go to our university to meet with our students to see some of the films they are producing, infused with hope, you know, to listen to their critical thinking, to see how they are tackling some tough issues that are maybe taboo in the Palestinian society, but they would like to express it through their art. Whenever I feel sometimes down, I go to look at the paintings that our students are doing, so colorful and infused with hope. And when I meet them, I see these are the signs of hope. These are the future leaders for Palestine. They will be able to do the job. They give me hope. Last September, the board of Bright Stars of Bethlehem came to visit us. And uh, I said, you know, we always meet in the college. Let's now go and visit some of our students in their homes. And we chose one student. Her name is Hanin. She comes from a very small remote village east of Bethlehem. It's one of few villages in Palestine that still has no electricity. We don't have many of those. And why they don't have electricity? Because it's surrounded by Israeli settlements, and the Israeli settlements don't want to have the wiring for the, for the electricity come through the settlement. Basically, they want to chase them out of there to take their land. And so a Jewish Dutch organization uh, gave this village solar panel so that they can power the village. And that was great. Suddenly, they had electricity. And they had it for six months. Because then the Israeli military came one night and took all the solar panel. <laughs> the village was back in dark. And we went there while there were no solar panels. They were gone. And we met Hanin. Uh, Hanin is a first generation student, the first of her family to go to university. And she decided to study contemporary art and doing well. And she took us to her village. And we were able to see the transformation that Hanin was doing to that village, gathering the kids of that community and giving them art classes empowering the women of that community uh, to tell their story, to tell their story very creatively. Even now, these women went to the, all the way to the Israeli high court and were able to get the solar panel back. When I look at Hanian, these are the signs of hope that we need all the time to look for. But the second point, we have to look to the signs of hope sometimes by looking at history long durée. You know, sometimes when you are sitting there in the middle of the problem, you cannot see over the edge of the, of the that's now German, over the edge of the plate, they say in German. You know, you are just overwhelmed with all of these problems. But it's really, for me, it was important to start looking at history long durée. And l let me tell you that. I mean, again, my first ever visit to the US was to Iowa 1991. I was invited to speak at uh, Wartburg College and give a lecture there. 
And I mean, I, I toured a bit around, and I was shocked that most of the people, the overwhelming majority I met at that visit, had no clue where Palestine is. <laughs> didn't know anything about the Palestinians, knew nothing that there are Christians there, nothing. You can be very depressed. Now, 27 years later, when I toured the US, most of the churches know much more about Palestine have some connection somehow to Palestinian Christians or to Palestinians in general. And suddenly, I mean, I mean, imagine that the Presbyterian Church, United Church of Christ, took resolutions to divest from comp companies that profit from the occupation. <laughs> Where were we 91? <laughs> If you would have told me 91 that the UCC, the Presbyterian Church, the Lutheran Church, the Methodist Church will dare to do something like that, I most probably I would have laughed like Sarah when she was told she's getting pregnant with 90. <laughs> but once you start looking at, at history long durée, you start seeing change. The landscape is changing. Even if President Trump is going into the other direction, the masses are moving in a different, and it's not only by churches, by the way. 1991, when I was here, there was only APAC, the American-Israel lobby, who's always, you know, more Roman than the Romans themselves always defending whatever Israel does. 15 years ago, some Jewish American felt this cannot be our sole representation. So they started something called J Street. They were American Jews calling for a two-state solution. But that was not enough. Maybe five, six years ago, came a new group of Jewish American called Jewish Voices for Peace. And they said, as Jewish people, we have to fight for justice and for the justice of the Palestinians in the first place. We cannot be for social justice in this country if we are not for political justice in our country. And it's not only Jewish Voices for Peace, you know, there are so many Jewish groups today that they are totally against the Israeli government and their policies. This is a sign of hope. From 91 till today, the Jewish American landscape is changing tremendously. If we don't see, we cannot grow hope. We need to see it and we need to, we need to support these groups, all of these groups, because these are the signs of hope. They keep us going. They keep us knowing that justice is coming, that peace is coming, that hope is coming. And the third thing to grow hope is we need to learn to celebrate the new victories, the small victories, irrespective how small they are. Because sometimes you are overwhelmed, you know, with all of these big news. You know, just yesterday, you know, I mean, just hearing that, you know, President Trump saying he's going now to move the embassy in May this year to Jerusalem. And he chose a date that is called in our history the Nakba, the catastrophe. This is when we lost 77% of our land. Then when, this is when 45% of the Christian community were kicked out of their homes. He chose that date, you know, to move the embassy to Jerusalem. What a humiliation, you know. Uh, and so sometimes you feel despair and you say, I mean, but we have to look for the small signs of hope, the small victories, 
And this morning was another small victory that we need to celebrate. This morning, the heads of the churches at the Holy Sepulchre, Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholics, Armenian, made a press conference and they declared that they're going to close the gates of the Holy Sepulchre. Why? Because Israel is debating a law. They want to tax churches, not only for their property, but even hospitals need to pay taxes, schools need to pay taxes, and basically churches will be uh, obliged to pay $213 million every year just in Jerusalem for the state of Israel. No way churches can get all of this money, and basically this will lead to the closure of everything. Some of you know Augusta Victoria Hospital, the largest hospital in Jerusalem, will be closed. They cannot pay the taxes. The schools there, the, the, the hostels, um, I mean the guest houses, everything will be closed if this tax law will go through. I tell you, I mean, when I look at the church hierarchy in Jerusalem, I'm always depressed. Because they were, they were all the time so soft. They didn't want to speak about the occupation, you know. They always wanted to please, you know, the state of Israel. And suddenly, they decide to close the gates for the Holy Sepulchre. Never ever thought that they will do something like that. Maybe because it went into their pocket and they were threatened by that, that they started speaking up. But this is a sign of hope. Because until recently, some of the heads of churches were saying, you know, uh, you know, occupation, Never mind. <laughs> now they know it's not never mind. Because there will be no churches if this will continue. And so they had to speak up. So this was a sign of hope for me this morning. So we have to look all the time for those signs of hope. And you know, again I think Martin Luther King was right when he said that the arch of the moral universe is long. How long, O oh Lord? It's really long, long enough, too long. But he said, it bends towards justice. It bends towards justice. That is where hope is. So let me end by saying, this is how I learned growing hope in Palestine. How can you grow hope in this country for Palestine? And I would like to share quickly, not three, but four things quickly, very quick with you. So what can we do to grow hope in Palestine? What can you do to grow hope in Palestine? Very quickly, the four P's I call them. You can guess what the first P is prayers. We need your prayers because they keep us going. But prayers mean, when you pray, it means there is hope. You still hope for a change. So this is why we need you to keep praying. But secondly, second P is pilgrimages. We need you to come and see. Because once you come and see, you start understanding the conflict. You hear the story that you never, ever will hear in American media. You will understand what the conflict is all about. So pilgrimages, come and see. And the third P is political advocacy. You know, whenever I go to the hill here to meet with, uh, to, uh, to uh, I almost said whenever I go to hell, no, I'm to the hill. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, whenever I go to the hill to meet with representatives there, people, members of Congress and so on, uh, you know, they, they keep telling me, you know what? Your people, they come to us 
or your friends, they come to us maybe twice a year, but the other group, they come every other week. So we need to go there every other week and to tell them, we would like to hear what are you doing about this point. And they need to hear from you, not from me, because you are their constituency. So that's hope. And last but not least, projects. We need churches, individuals to invest in Palestine at a time when people think it's not time for investment. I'm not talking only about companies, but I'm talking about churches supporting projects. You know, often when American groups come to the Holy Land, they do a tour through the West Bank, they get depressed. And I feel when they come to me, they are so depressed. Maybe because they feel, how come that we don't know this? <laughs> how come that this story was not told in our media? But also, you know, of, I mean, when you look at, at, at the settlements, I mean, these are colonies, these are whole cities. Uh, they get depressed and they think, you know, I mean, we don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And so then they bring them to me to build them up. Because I always say, you know, we don't need depressed people. <laughs> depressed people cannot, more, cannot make difference. It's only hopeful people who can make difference in our world. And so I hope that each and every one of you can make difference in your life, in your communities, and in the world today. Thank you very much. Yes, Arnie? We need both mics, so. Okay, thanks. Couple of questions. What's the attitude toward of the Palestinian government toward Christians in Palestine. And then second, I had a good friend who taught Arabic for the State Department, and she thought there was a disconnect between the Palestinian Arabs and the other Arab states. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, let me start with the last one and, and go. Uh, I mean, I would say definitely there is a kind of disconnect uh, between Palestine and the Arab states uh, for the simple reason that, you know, when we talk about the Arab world, it is as if it were a monolithic group of, of states, but it's not because each, each state uh, has its own I mean, look now, even just not to forget about Palestine, look at Qatar and Saudi Arabia, <laughs> you know, neighbors, uh, good allies until two years ago, and now, you know, they are like uh, arch enemies, uh, even, uh, you know, uh, um, even uh, aeroplanes are not allowed to, to go into each other uh, hemisphere. So, I mean, that's unfortunately, uh, the Arab world is, is very complex, very diverse, uh, with, uh, with, with very conflicting uh, interests, unfortunately. Um, and often, you know, some of the Arab leaders were using always the Palestinian uh, conflict just to keep their, their people somehow busy with Palestine so that they will not care about civil rights and and civil society and democracy and these kinds of things. Uh, the attitude of the Palestinian Authority towards Christians, I would say in general, it's, it's very positive. Uh, uh, just to give you example, in, in average, in every Palestinian government uh, uh, um, cabinet, there are in average two Christian ministers. Right now, actually, three Christian ministers. The Minister of Finance is a Christian, very important post. The Minister of Economy, she is a Christian. The Minister of Tourism, she is a Christian. Three out of 20, this is much higher than our percentage suggests. 
Uh, I was talking about Israel taxing churches. In Palestine, churches are exempt from taxes. I mean, just to, for you to see the difference, because again, this is something you don't hear here, you know. Um, and I forgot the first question, but that was too, okay, good. Okay, someone else? Uh, thank you so much for what you've shared. Um, being an Episcopalian, I'm curious about the collaboration between you and Bishop Suhail over there. And uh, I was glad to hear about the, the Holy Sepulchre action. But what other kinds of collaboration are, are, are going on? Yeah, thank you. You know, since we are an Episcopalian church, let me also say that uh, maybe what you don't know is that the Lutheran Church and the Episcopalian Church in Palestine, they started together as one church. Back in 1841, we were one church. And then the split came 1886. Not for, uh, you know, uh, dogmatic uh, reasons, but you can imagine for political reasons. Because in 1886, uh, the situation of Germany was different. Uh, 1879, Bismarck uh, united Germany. Until that moment, England was the empire per se and didn't need to, to share anything with the Germans. And suddenly the Germans were very strong and this actually led to splitting the church. And they did it in their imperial way they came together and they had a gentleman agreement. They said all the Protestant churches north of Jerusalem should become Episcopalian and all the churches south of Jerusalem Lutheran. <laughs> Christmas Lutheran happened to be in Bethlehem, became Lutheran. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, these are empires. This is why, you know, I, I, I love writing about empires because, you know, it's, so, but uh, I would say we have, uh, we have very, uh, very strong ties uh, together. Uh, and to be frank, it's, I mean, the relationship between the two churches depends on the two bishops. If they like each other or not. But in general, we are very close. Correct, yeah, correct, yeah. The Episcopal Church in Gaza and in Nablus, the Lutheran Church in Jerusalem. Else? I'm uh, curious about the situation of the Christian Arabs in Palestine and surrounding states. Is that number is decreasing and is there any hope in, in that situation? The situation of, of Christians in the Arab world in Palestine and Arab world. Right, right, yeah. I mean, again, it doesn't look very good. Um, I, I actually, I have a book uh, coming out soon. My next book is, is going to be called uh, The Rise and Fall of Christianity in the Middle East. And I look at the history of the uh, Christian communities throughout the Middle East 19th and 20th century. Uh, just to give you an example, if, if you would have lived in that area 1914, you would have thought that the best years for Christianity in the Middle East are yet to come. In Palestine at that time, um, 60 3% of all schools were Christian schools. <laughs> now, it's a totally different story. Uh, in Iraq, you know, Christian survived different dictatorship, but uh, they didn't survive the American invasion in 2003 
over one million Iraqi Christians uh, left Iraq after 2003. Uh, we'll not talk about Christians in Syria, same story, you know, uh, with all what's going on with ISIS and so on, uh, it's, it's tough. Um, so if you look at all the countries in the region, the percentage of Christians is decreasing rapidly. Not because of Islam, but because the whole political context. The only place which is maybe surprising where, where the percentage of Christians is growing is in the Gulf region, but these are expatriate Christians. These are Christians from, uh, you know, from uh, the Philippines or from India or uh, those countries that they come uh, to work as, 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 uh, uh, as guest workers in those countries. Uh, in Palestine, it's tough. I mean, if the Israeli occupation continues, I'm not sure that Christianity will be able to survive. This is unfortunately almost the case in Gaza. In Gaza today, there are less than 1,200 Christians left. We did the study a few years ago. We were able to count them one by one, uh, which really means within this generation, Christianity will cease to exist in Gaza. So it's really, it's really tough. But it's not only tough for Christians. You know, we did the study just three months ago about uh, immigration. Uh, we asked 500 uh, Christians and 500 Muslims about their intention to immigrate or not. 28% of the Christians said they would leave the area because of the political situation, because of the occupation, and because of the economic situation, lack of jobs and so on, if they had a chance, 28% of the Christians, 24% of the Muslims, almost the same. You know, yesterday I was here in, uh, we were in, uh, in Ames, and there was a, a young Palestinian Christian from Bethlehem, Muslim. And I was talking to her, she's on exchange program. And she said, you know, she doesn't like to go back. You know, as a young woman, you know, once you experience here, you can move freely. You know, there are no checkpoints, you know. You can do what you want. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't look uh, uh, very, very positive. But this is why we are determined to stay there. Uh, I cannot anymore tell anyone don't immigrate. It's very tough. The only thing I can do is I can myself take that decision and stay because I believe God wants us to be there and to be there now. Because this is where we belong, where we can make a difference. Yeah, you know, again, I, I, my, uh, you know, my, uh, my advice is, is not to react to them, but to say, you know, actually, um, you know, we uh, stand together with many Jewish people and with many Muslim people and with many Christian from this country and from Palestine. We stand together. Uh, actually uh, working for the same thing, which is a just peace in that region, for a situation where Israel and Palestinian can live on equal footing, uh, where Christians, Muslims, and Jews can, can live uh, in peace, and where there is no oppression, that is actually our, our goal, and we do it with everyone who believe in these goals. And thanks God that, as I said, there are many Muslims, many Jews, and many Christians who share these goals with us. So it's not, uh, and you know, I mean, if they say this or that, just don't give them that attention. Uh, just have the right people 
with you and 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 just you know keep telling the story keep telling the story i think we have still three questions here that i see hi thank you i wonder if you are if uh, youth and child detention is still a huge issue is it an escalating issue is it decreasing what are you seeing right now with that thank you yeah, I mean, uh, uh, children uh, detention is still, uh, unfortunately, in the increase. Uh, maybe if you follow uh, the Palestinian uh, social media, uh, you know that uh, a young uh, woman, a teenager, her name is Ahd Tamimi, uh, a Palestinian Muslim, blonde hair, blue eyes, Palestinian woman uh, is now like the icon because uh, she was detained and she had the courage actually to slap the Israeli soldiers on his face and she became like you know the symbol of resistance uh, but but her story is actually is just to highlight uh, I don't have the exact number now of how many children detainees are there in Palestinian prisons but they are enough. And in fact, I have to say that one of the courageous Congress, members of Congress in this country, from Minnesota, uh, 4th District, uh, McCollum is her name. She was able to get a petition uh, to be signed by uh, many members of Congress uh, asking Israel to end the detention of Palestinian kids. Uh, very, very courageous woman. So I, in fact, last week when I was on the hill, I made, uh, Beth and I, we made it a point to stop at her office just to thank her for that stand. Because again, you know, we need to keep encouraging people that has that courage to speak truth to power. It always comes with a price tag, but they are able to tell the story. So. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm Salvatore from Tanzania in East Africa. So I'm a PhD candidate here at the University of Iowa. So I have only one question. Um, of all the P's you have suggested, I don't see uh, the importance of having inter-religious dialogue between Muslims, and um, Christians in Palestine in order to see the new signs of hope in Palestine. Do you, by the way, hold interreligious dialogue in Palestine as also a means of seeing uh, the signs of hope in Palestine? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, an important question, you know. Um I belong actually to, to those who started interfaith dialogue back in the, uh, in the early 90s, Christian Muslim, uh, but also Christian Jewish, a Christian Jewish Muslim, uh, back at that time. That was, you know, something unheard of at that time, and I was very much engaged with. I have to say, with the time somehow, uh, I got uh, bored a bit with, with that kind of interfaith dialogue because we ended up with the same uh, seven pastors and the same seven shaykhs and the same seven rabbis, and we kept massaging each other religiously. Uh, it felt good, you know, uh, but I felt it, you know, the spark was not really reaching the people that we want to reach. And so we changed a bit, we changed a bit uh, strategy. In fact, I said tomorrow I have a presentation to give at this global religious summit in, in Vienna. And my topic is actually, I will share about the first of its kind network of all Christian seminaries and Islamic Sharia colleges in the Arab world 
that we were able to launch last year. <coughs> it was our initiative. Nobody thought that this will be possible. But there is now a network of all Christian seminaries and Muslim Sharia colleges in the Arab world. There are 18 of them right now members in this network. And our goal is to have 30 by 2020. And the idea is that we said, you know, it doesn't make sense to try somehow to convince people on the street of interfaith dialogue, because this is an endless story. But if we can actually work with all future pastors and all future sheikhs and imam in the, in the seminaries and colleges where they are trained. And so what we are doing is we are developing a first of its kind joint, joint curricula, a three, a three credit hours curricula that all seminaries and all colleges will teach. Uh, we, will, we have created a, a fund uh, for exchange. Uh, so that because right now in most of these colleges, like in Islamic college, it's a Muslim scholar teaching Christianity. And in a Christian seminary, it's a Christian theologian teaching Islam. We said, we have a fund, invite somebody to talk about his or her own religion. Uh, so we created funds for that, for student exchange. So this is now where I'm putting some of my energy. Uh, so it is important. I didn't mention it here because uh, uh, I felt it's a different maybe topic than the one I wa wanted to focus on. I think there is one last question and I know I need to... They're telling me you need to get to the airplane soon, I yes. need to get my, my, my plane. Uh, and so if I rush out, please don't think I don't want to talk to you, but... And thank you very much for your comments, very interesting. And I wanted to comment, if I could, on the four Ps, one of which is pilgrimage. And I work with Friends of Seville, and I will be leading a trip at the end of June if anybody's interested in a pilgrimage. And we'll be spending some time in Bethlehem. We'll be seeing the work that Mitri does here. So I'd be happy to talk to anybody um, if you're interested in a pilgrimage to see the work of peace and justice that's happening. We will end there. We thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.